Larry, I'm wondering if you can tell us the first screenplay you've ever sold and what was happening in your life at that time. Uh, the first screenplay I sold was uh, Beetlejuice. And I had been a, a screenwriter, was screenwriting. I was also working as a story analyst. I was union story analyst, local 854. I still have my card in case all else fails. Um, and I worked all around. I mean, I worked at every studio in town. And uh, I, uh, I was working at Paramount. Uh, I was, uh, as, a, as a story analyst, I suffered a real case of writer's block, uh, uh, and I had a chance to audition to become a studio executive for Jeff Katzenberg and Michael Eisner. I uh, saw that as sort of a doorway out of, out of uh, screenwriting, which I was feeling very uh, up in the air about and wondering if I could really do it. And I became a studio executive for a couple of years. Uh, at Paramount, and then I went to work for Walter Hill, uh, the d great director Walter Hill as his head of development, and there were uh, a series of incidents uh, that uh, made me realize that I was giving away my best ideas and giving away my talent uh, uh, in a way I was no longer comfortable with. And I wanted to go back to screenwriting, uh, and, I, and I formed a partnership with the, the two Michaels, as I refer to them, the late Michael Bender, who was my producing partner, and the late Michael McDowell, who was my uh, Beetlejuice writing partner, and we wrote Beetlejuice on spec, uh, and uh, finished it. And I had uh, uh, taken, um, uh, a, a reduction in salary and gone back to script reading to support us, well, support myself and my family uh, while, while uh, we were writing Beetlejuice. And so that was, the first, that, that was the first one. And when it was finished, I had a very good relationship with a very prominent studio head who shall remain nameless. Uh, and, I, and when Beetlejuice was finished, I gave it to him to read on a Friday. And he said, I'm happy to read it. And I got a call on a Monday that he wanted to meet with me. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, he read it. He must love it or he would not be summoning me to his office so quickly. And I went into his office and he said to me, Larry, what are you doing? He said, you have actually a very good future as an, as, as, as an executive, as a producer. This piece of crap is going to sink you and sink your career. Why would you put this on the marketplace representing you? And uh, he said, it's weird. It makes no sense. It's not commercial. And um, I left that meeting, <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, 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 to say to say a little, take it aback a little. Uh, uh, it would be putting it mildly. He could not understand why I would want this bizarre piece of junk uh, representing me. Uh, uh, and uh, but I had also given it to because I've taught for like 25, 30 years, primarily at UCLA, and I was teaching a story analysis class at that time. And I had a student named Marjorie Lewis. And uh, I thought she was the smartest young woman in my class. And she had a low level um, uh, development job at the Geffen Company. And I'd given it her, to her to read only to see what she thought because I really had learned to value her opinion. And so coming out of this meeting, uh, uh, feeling very bad about myself, uh, I called Marjorie and I said, did you read it? And she said, yes, I read it. And I said, did you like it? And she said, like it, I'm gonna get the Geffen Company to buy it. And, uh, as, and knowing Marjorie, what she did was that she just put it on people's desks and she was so tenacious and she was so annoying that people just finally said, okay, we'll read it, we'll read it. And, uh, and uh, that's how it 
got to the Geffen Company and that's how it got read. And Marjorie is, uh, probably, like I say, probably one of two unsung heroes of that film. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, the Geffen Company uh, proceeded to buy it um, for our asking price, oh my God, which was incredible, and then on it went. And we can talk more about that experience uh, as you want to. Yeah. I'm wondering the time frame from when you had this epiphany or this thing that happened where you said, I no longer want to give away whatever it was, your advice or your wisdom or your talent in this manner anymore from when you were in more of an administrative or, or executive type role yeah. and wanted to, how, what was the time frame from then when Marjorie finally got it to the Geffen Company? Well, um, I had, uh, my, when, when, I, when I went to work for Walter Hill, I left Paramount, I went to work for Walter Hill uh, uh, and the Phoenix Company. And, and Walter was one of the producers of Alien, the first Alien film. And, uh, and his partner and, and my, my two bosses, David Geiler, was another one of the producers. And when I went to work for them, uh, the, one of the first things they said to me, uh, one of the primary things that your job is going to be is to find us a writer for the Alien sequel. And I, uh, and I, uh, without going into detail, certain promises were made to me if I found that writer, good things would happen. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, and uh, I met with Jim Cameron and uh, th th this, th this is, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say I discovered Jim Cameron for Aliens and that's pretty true. But if you had my job and Jim, and this was, I, I believe that uh, Terminator was maybe in pre-production or post, it's, it's long enough, I don't remember, but uh, Terminator was, was not out there. But if you uh, read the script of Terminator and met Jim Cameron and you didn't think that he was going to be the Jim Cameron, you didn't deserve my job. Uh, so this was, this was hardly like a, 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 a great insight on my part. You just met, met Jim and he was a force of nature and you could just feel the talent. Uh, but it still was a hard sell because he had a he had a, a not very good movie called Piranha 2 uh, That that you know that I had to show people and this was back in the day when you had to set up a projector and you know in an office and and and, and hope all the light wasn't bleeding and and but I just I, but anyway there, it was it was a bit of a struggle it was a bit of a fight uh, but Jim not only became the writer, obviously, but the director of Aliens. And I went to my bosses and said, okay, I think I did my job. I think I not only uh, brought the writer to the project, I brought the director to the project, look what I did. And they said, yes, you did, so what? Uh, and it was enough. I, I just felt, uh, and I'd had an experience at Paramount with a film called Young Sherlock Holmes, which was an original idea of mine and as an executive there we were under so much pressure to bring in ideas that I did something I told myself I was never going to do because I sort of had a little file of ideas that one day if I write again I'm going to write and that was one of them and I brought that in and there were a lot of promises made to me if that got made great things would happen and it did get made uh, uh, written by Chris Columbus uh, um, uh, and I, I just, I, I just realized, and, and also I just, I, I was a writer. I mean, that's who I was. And I'd let that go. And I had allowed myself to suffer a classic case of writer's block. And, uh, and I just said, I'm going to be a writer again. And I got, I got very blessed having my partner, Michael McDowell, who was as professional a writer as I'd ever come across and working with him, uh, inspired me, challenged me, uh, uh, made me understand what it m truly meant to be a writer and a screenwriter and a screenwriter with a career. And, I, and, 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 when, when, and, and the, the epiphany was actually, I don't wanna, I, I, I wanna be a writer again and I, I'm just kind of selling myself short and selling my talent short by not doing it and get over the fear and, and do it.
How many hours a week were you working before? And then once you said you took, did you say you took a script reader job and then I, yeah, to pare I, down? I, yeah, I, right. I mean, when I was at Paramount, we uh, we worked seven days a week. Uh, uh, th there's stories about Jeff Katzenberg and his work schedule that people think are uh, apocryphal. Maybe they're not. Uh, uh, I, there there would never be a job uh, in 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 Hollywood that I would be afraid of after working for Jeff. He was, it, because we worked uh, seven days a week, 14, 16, 18 hours a day. Um, and, um, and he was a very demanding boss, but he was a great boss. And I developed an enormous amount, and having never gone to college, never had that experience, uh, I, I felt like I was in the most brilliant film school in the world having that job. And again, incredibly demanding in terms of time and 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 uh, and uh, just feeling like you never left the office. But it was it was a it was a boot camp, but it was a great boot camp. But I was also and and I, I wasn't writing then, not because uh, I I didn't have time to write. I could always have found a half hour a day to write. But I just didn't think of myself as a writer anymore. But when I was when I finally started writing with Michael McDowell, we started writing Beetlejuice. I would do my uh, my day job, fit it in, and then Michael and I would work. I mean, and you know, and we'd slot in an hour or two a day, and then we got some financing uh, where I could leave behind the script reading and we could focus on Beetlejuice. Maybe this is a good story uh, for aspiring screenwriters out there. Uh, when I when I went to work with with uh, Michael McDowell on Beetlejuice, uh, we had been working for a couple of weeks, and he sat down with me and he said, "Larry, this is not working out. This is not happening." And I was taken aback, and I said, "Why? What do you mean?" He said, because you're just sitting around waiting for inspiration. And I don't work like that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to sit around waiting for, for you to be inspired. If you're going to work with me, and Michael was as professional writer as I had ever met. He had published, I don't know, 19, 20 novels, horror novels, genre, genre, great genre novels. He had written for a show called Tales from the Dark Side. He was the real deal. And, 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 and not, a, not, not, a, not, a, not, not a person to, to hold back his feelings, <laughs> okay? Um, and, he, and, he, and again, he said to me, this is just not happening. And he, and he said, and this, this was the most, this changed my, my life as a writer. He said, if you're going to work with me, look at it like we're working in a bank. We get in at nine, we have a cup of coffee, we say good morning, we, we, then we go to work. And we, work. and we write until lunch, we go have our lunch, we come back, we write again until around three o'clock in the afternoon, we fold up the writing, we return whatever phone calls, whatever business of writing we have to do, and we do this five, six days a week. And, we're, and, and, and it's a job. It's, it's, it's not you sitting in a, with a metaphorical beret in a metaphorical loft waiting for inspiration to strike. It's a job. And it was a bit of tough love and it took me aback. Uh, uh, and and I was, I, I suppose, a tiny bit offended. But then, then the thing he said to me that sealed the deal, because I, when I was working at Paramount, I was writing script notes. Again, it was, it was like a 16-hour day often. And, and probably 14 of those hours a day was writing script notes. And he said, Larry, you've told me you've written hundreds of pages of notes for other people's scripts. Why can't you do it for yourself? And I was like, wow, okay, I will try it your way. And it changed my perception of who a writer is, what a writer does. And it changed my work habits, and it changed uh, everything. And I did it his way, and I took all of that, all, all, and he was absolutely right. 
all of that discipline that I'd put into other people's work, I put in. I, I started putting into my work, our work, and 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 it was. It, it, and and Beetlejuice came out of that. And as crazy and you know, and as far out as that movie is, the script was written in a very disciplined way, because that was the way Michael needed to work. Larry, why do you feel that Beetlejuice sold? Why did that screenplay sell, in your opinion? You, you know, I, this is going to sound so pretentious, maybe, but um, when when I decided I was going to be a writer again and decided I was going to do it with Michael, in my mind I said to myself, that oh, sounds so awful, maybe, but I'm going to write a classic. Oh. I'm not just going to write another movie. We are going to create a classic. And who knows what that means. And again, it sounds obnoxious, maybe. But um, uh, we knew probably, I don't know, 20 some pages in that just something was happening. And we weren't thinking about demographics. We weren't thinking about who the audience was going to be. We weren't thinking about any, any quote unquote commercial uh, uh, um, aspects of it. We were thinking what's good, what's funny, what's making us laugh, what's moving the story forward. What are the zaniest, craziest ideas we can have? And it just, it, and, and it, it happens with, with, with scripts, and, and it happens in your writing. There's just times that you feel that you're in a zone and you're in a place that you're so connecting with yourself and you're so connecting with what your vision is that if you can get it on a page, other people are going to see it and feel it too. And that movie was, was that. And uh, we didn't know what was going to happen with it. Uh, when, when the movie was finished, there were people at Warner Brothers in the marketing department who absolutely hated it. They wanted to change the title to House Ghost and dump it. And back in the days when you'd put it in a thousand theaters or something and let it run a week and then hopefully it would go away. That wasn't everyone. And we had David Geffen on our side, so we were protected. But it was hardly loved. Uh, uh, but um, I knew who we were writing it for. And, uh, and in my mind, uh, and uh, this is a very 80s reference, there was a band, uh, there, there was still a band, The Cure, The Great Cure, a uh, band I loved. Mm -hmm. And I had gone to see them at the Rose Bowl, huge concert, maybe 50,000 people. Nice. And it felt to me like it was 50,000 teenage girls in black. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was probably yeah, one of them, you know, yeah. right? I you was know, just and, <laughs> and 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 that was and 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 the Winona Ryder character Lydia came out of that. And I always thought thought that's who the audience for this movie is. And as we were writing it, and, and, and I, 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 that for me, and it may have been different for Michael, but that was always who I thought this movie was being written for. And, and it's really a family story, and it's about a, a girl who needs a mom and a dad, and, 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 and because her real mom and dad just don't understand her, and don't spend enough time with her, so she ends up with two ghosts. That's the heart of that movie, and that's what I was writing towards. And the most, and, and the, so, so finally it's, it's released, and I go to see it uh, uh, nearby where we're sitting now at Universal uh, on a Friday night. It's the first Friday night, and I watch it with an audience, a real audience for the first time. Of course, there have been some test audiences and all of that. And people are coming out of it either loving it or hating it, which I thought, great. That's exactly what we wanted. And that was, that was Friday night. Then Saturday night, I went back and I saw a bunch of teenage girls who had gone into their closet, having seen it on Friday night, and came back dressed like Winona Ryder, Lydia Dietz. And I thought, okay, it's a hit. 
we have connected with the audience to the point that they're already dressing up as Lydia. And then there was a marketing meeting at Warner Brothers, it may have been on the Monday, and it had surpassed everyone's expectations in terms of the grosses and, 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 and the, the, the audience feedback. And it was obvious that, the, that it was, that was going to take off and be something special. And again, in, in this no-name zone, there was... There, there, <laughs> That's what I was wondering about, Mr. No-Name. There no was, name. A, there was yeah. a marketing person <laughs> uh -huh. who I always remember as a guy who would wear a scarf no matter what the temperature was, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was... Uh, it, 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 I remember Tim Burton being there and David Geffen being there and the, the Michaels and myself and this marketing person all he could say, all he could, the best he could do was, well, at least we got the little girls in black to come see it. And we walked out of the meeting and Tim said, well, who the F did we think he made it for? Yeah. <laughs> who did he think we made it for? And, and, and uh, it was just, it, it, and, and, and when, thing, when things are going well in my writing, and I, th I think it's true for all writers that if, if you're like intensely self-conscious about who is your audience, who, who is it, you know, uh, is this for the 12 to 16 year old? You, if you're doing that, you're not writing well. And you get in a zone and your story starts telling you. You're not telling the story. It's emerging from someplace within you. And that's what Beetlejuice was. And I just always had to, and I used to say to Michael sometimes, because I could feel it going well, and I'd say, Michael, you know we're going to have a toy line. And he'd go, shut up, shut up. <laughs> just let's just finish the script, you know. <laughs> right. But I, I mean, it's, it's a very hard thing to explain what that, what that, what that it, 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 it's, a, it's an epiphany after an epiphany, and that you feel like you're just onto something bigger than you, you know. Well, going back to the other no-name person, yeah. then did they ever reach out to you? Here they kind of put you in a spot where you're almost on a ledge, metaphorically, and then you're just elated with validation that this worked, even though maybe you didn't totally expect it. But did that person ever reach out to you? No. Okay. No, because, because that, 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 that would have required a certain amount of humility and, and a certain willingness to to say, you know what, I, I, I guess wrong on this one. And not everyone has that ability. Is there a specific kind of story a first-time screenwriter should write? Uh, yes. And what, what, what that story is, and, and you know, it's not that cliche, write what you know, because I've never written what I quote unquote know I, I write fantastical worlds and 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 uh, and, and uh, supernatural s stories and all of that, but write what you feel and write what's in your heart and write something that means something to you. And you know, I, I, I was a script reader for God probably a decade, and I, and uh, the and and I was reading seven eight scripts a week, uh, and. The rare one was the great script, and when you found that, that was a very exciting day at the office. And sometimes the really terrible scripts were kind of, they were fun because they were so god-awful. But the ones that, that got really exhausting and really enervating is a script reader who's sitting there and has to read a script, synopsize it, write a comment about it, then pick up another one and read it, and so on, were the ones that you could tell were written by people who were looking at what last year's hit was and trying to imitate it. And uh, those were deadly. And they, were, they weren't they were good, they weren't bad, they were safe and mediocre. And any writer, any young writer, any old writer, anyone who's just starting to write anything, write something that you feel Write, 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 write something that comes from the heart. And, and, and people may not think that Beetlejuice is a personal movie. It's an intensely personal movie. It was intensely personal for Michael and me. 
Uh, and, and, you know, I, I didn't know I had a theme until I had enough work to realize I had a theme. And almost everything I've written are about broken families who are put back together in some bizarre way. But, there, but, but because I came from a broken family. And, 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 uh, what, and, and, and so, so the, there's a, I, I like to think that my work has a sense of heart and a sense of compassion and a sense of humanity in it, no matter how bizarre it is, no matter how weird the worlds get. Uh, uh, and and you, you, got, you got to write something that you feel and something that, that you have some passion for. Or just why do it? It's too hard. It's just, it's, it, 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 it's not an easy job. And, and I personally can't imagine saying, well, this was a hit. Now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write my version of that. I don't really, it's not really what I care about, what I feel, but I can imitate it well enough. I, I can't imagine spending a year of your life doing that, but people do it all the time. And they usually write mediocre scripts. Is being safe something that's never appealed to you? I, 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 I don't know how in, 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 in my career and in my life. <laughs> Sa safe hasn't factored into it. And, uh, and, and uh, not, not, always, not always the best decisions, uh, maybe, but I'm just, I, I sort of like jumping off cliffs. What's the first step in writing a screenplay? There, there's, there, there's, there, there's just, a, there's an idea. And usually what I know is I know, Beetlejuice, for instance, the idea was that I discussed with my partners, a psychedelic ghost comedy. We had no idea what that meant, but it rolled off the tongue, right? And, 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 and I usually have something of an idea like that, and I kind of know the beginning, and I kind of know the end. The middle is the great unknown, but, 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 but it's, a, it's an instinct and an idea, and sometimes it's a character, and sometimes it's a situation, but it's very, it's very internal at first, and, and, and yes, there's times where you write on assignment, you know, and, and, and you're, you're, you're given an idea and say, translate this into a movie. But in terms of my, um, my, 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 own, my, my own writing, if you will, my, my, my personal writing, it usually comes from, from, from just uh, the most basic kind of idea and a feeling, you know, and, 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 and it's like, um, and I'm, I'm, I, I can't articulate it very well. I'm sorry because it's hard to articulate, but it's just kind of like a, again, like, like like a situation or a character that's just kind of waiting to come out. And then you whatever you, what, whatever your process is, and boy, do you need a process, and boy, do you need to go to work, and boy, do you need to sit down and do it and do the job of writing and, and, and you allow that, that character or that situation to just start growing and start, start coming, you know, leaving your fingers onto the digital page these days, you know, onto your computer and then it grows and expands and it takes on life. And, and uh, you know, I, there, there's, of course, and, and this, is, this is every writer's choice, uh, there's a lot of talk about backstory always, you know, like, like, tell it, you know, where did your character go to school? How, you know, what, what, what was his or her mommy like and all of that? I've never written a backstory in my life, never. But if you ask me to tell me the backstory of one of my characters, I could. I'd kind of be making it up as I went along, but the feelings would be true. Because I feel I, I, I feel the characters and I and, and, and I feel like they need to come out and I feel like they need to be given a voice and and that's just that that that's that's what writing is to me uh, um, 
an idea or a character or a situation or an emotion or a feeling um, that, that, that you somehow have to put into the world. And it's hard to articulate, and I, and I feel like I'm talking in circles, but, I, but it's, it, it just, it's almost hard not to because it's so, it, it's so ephemeral in the beginning. You know, I, I hope that makes some version of sense. It does, and, I, and I, so the middle, it sounds like, is undetermined, but you know an ending when you start something. I kind of know an mm -hmm. ending. I, I kind of know an ending, but that can all change. But uh, uh, people get very scared of the middle, but for me, that's when it gets fun because it's so challenging, and you so get to what you know in a screenplay if you think of a screenplay as 110 120 pages you get to page 60 and you go oh my god <laughs> i'm only halfway there what happens next but but something will happen and and i, I and that's exhilarating and it's exhilarating to go to bed completely sure that you will never figure out what's going to happen next and wake up with the answer and that and 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 and, it, and it's you know it, it, it's it's uh, it's it's a daily challenge but it's uh it's so it feel it feels so good to realize that that next scene will be there if you keep working at it there's there's it's the best feeling in the world other than finishing and then finishing it's like the first draft no matter what shape it's in is like brilliant. I mean, that's just, I always uh, uh, get tears in my eyes when I finish a first draft because I feel like I'm saying goodbye to a group of people that I've been on this journey with. And, and, and there's, a, there, there's a very emotional side to it. And then, you know, then you become the craftsman and time for a second draft and all of that. But uh, it, it's it's an it's an emotional journey, and and to do that day after day, it's it's incredibly rewarding. It's, I've got the best job in the world. So let's say you're 60 pages in. Yeah. And now you're kind of like, what do I do next? Yeah. So keeping in the vein of not waiting for inspiration. Yeah. And and you're treating this as a job. It's like working at a bank. Yeah. So what's happening? Let's suppose it's 9 a.m. Monday morning. You're 60 pages in. You've got the cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And you're there, and um, you. I will go back. I will never go back to the beginning because that is a death trap. I know what I'll do. I'll go back and rewrite the first sixty pages, and then I'll go back and rewrite the first sixty pages again and again. I'll go back and read a couple of pages, and 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 maybe do some cosmetic stuff just to get you know, to, just to put myself. Uh, it, it, back into the zone of the story and then you just and then I just start writing and they may not be good ideas there may be my my my, my drafts are always 20 30 pages too long uh, when, when I finish the first draft because I'm telling the story to myself uh, but I I, I I forget who it was I'm gonna say Oscar Wilde I'm gonna say some famous writer said just sit down and start typing your name over and over. Oscar Wilde may have been pre-typewriter. I bet, but but you understand the point. Start typing your name. Start doing anything with your fingers, and I, and again, it's it's like um, where that comes from and where that next scene comes from. It's there. It it, it is there, uh, and if you put yourself in a position to find it, you will find it. And I might spend a day writing 10 basically bad pages, but there'll be one page of truth in it and one, one moment that will move the story forward. And, and Stephen King talks about this really brilliantly. And uh, he, I have questions about outlining and I'm not, here to have an outline debate. He's scathing about outlining. If you've ever read his book on writing, um, great, probably the best book on writing ever written to my mind. But he always says it's what happens next. 
It's what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. And, you know, if I were to reach across the room here and, and steal your, pay, your, 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 your notes from you, <laughs> there would be a response. Yes. That, and, or if I were to kick the camera over and say, I'm done with this interview, there would be a response, right? And then it's what happens next. Do you jump on me and say, give me my notes back, you jerk? Do you, I mean, and it's really that, it, it's kind of gets, it, it, and if you just look at it like that, that, that and, and, and you look at it like, like, like whatever, whatever you made happen, Something has to happen next, and it's what happens next, what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. That what happens next will come, and it may not come easily, and there may be a lot of, like I said, bad what happens next before you right, find the right what happens next. But it'll come, and, it's, it, and it's, it, 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 it's a magical process. I mean, magical in the sense that, that it, it, it's almost unexplainable, uh, and, it's why, and it's why there's so many... Uh, 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 screenwriting programs and apps and, and, and all of these things out there to kind of tell you that they can tell you what happens next, but they can't tell you what happens next. Only you can tell you what happens next. And I look at it as a moment by moment process. And I put these characters in a situation and it's often diabolical and it's often otherworldly and they've got to get themselves either deeper into it or get the hell out of it and that's the journey and, and it's moment by moment and it's and it's it's sort of literally second by second if you think about it you know movies move forward in a linear fashion and it's just and, it, and it's just tracking that and 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 putting your character and and when when it really gets fun is when you put your character in the most Difficult. Hey, here, can I tell you a quick anecdote that 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 is probably the, the, the a, an illustration that I use about this all the time. I'll tell you a quick story about what happens next. But I'll tell you when I teach the very first class, I always say, and I make the statistic up depending on how I'm feeling the room. Uh, uh, I just <laughs> I will say ninety eight percent of you will fail, and people go, oh. right. uh -huh. <laughs> and, and I say you'll fail because you'll never finish. You will never finish your script, and and sad but true. I'm I'm not wrong. I'm 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 pretty darn close, and I've taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students at this point, and not finishing is exactly what most people will do. I just have, I, I've just been teaching a workshop uh, where I've given people 12 weeks to finish a draft uh, uh, that they've been working on for a long time and the dropout rate is enormous. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what you said. This is perfectionism and this is not allowing yourself the ability to fail. And it's a huge mistake. Uh, you, you have to, you know, ba ba baseball metaphors get tossed around a lot uh, in, in the screenwriting trade because they kind of fit in a way. Like if you're batting 300, you're doing great, but that means you're hitting the ball once every three times, right? Um, and, and, uh, and, and, but to go back to this what happens next idea and how I, you know, and, and you, you had said, you wake up on Monday morning with your cup of coffee and you've gone to work and you have no idea what, what needs to happen next in your script. Well, a story I, I, t I tell about this uh, uh, almost always in my classes was uh, from Beetlejuice where uh, there, 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 there's a scene that a lot of people love, actually. It's, it's, it's become like a lot of people, one of their favorite scenes. And uh, the ghost, Barbara, uh, Barbara and Adam, Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, they've died, they've driven off a bridge, uh, trying to avoid a dog. Aren't they good people? They try to avoid the doggy and they've driven off a bridge and they've drowned. And they're trapped in their house now as ghosts. And they've been given a book about how to how, the handbook for the recently deceased that they can't make that they can't figure it out, and they want to go into the afterlife and ask questions about how to be ghosts and how they're supposed to live, it, you know, <laughs> live as ghosts, or die as ghosts, whatever. Uh, and and uh, but but what Michael, my my writing partner Michael McDowell and I had done is. Uh, 
We had trapped them so well in their house, we had no idea how to get them into the afterlife. We had done a very good job of sticking them there with what felt like no exit. And we had to come up with a way for them to get out of the house. And uh, the dynamic between, you, you, got, you got to understand, Michael was, I'm going to say Harvard educated, if not Harvard, some incredibly prestigious university. Uh, I, I grew up in a trailer park and barely got out of high school, okay? <laughs> there was, there, there, there was, there, there was a, 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 sometimes it, it was usually, usually playful, but sort of a status issue between us. And, and, and the way we'd often work is that I would like vomit out ideas and he would just start shooting them down. And it was always one word, no, no, no. <laughs> No, and we were trying to come up with a way to get them out of the house, Barbara and Adam, the ghosts, get them into the afterlife. And I was coming up with more and more convoluted ideas about how to get them out of the house. And I'm sure trying to bring out my supernatural chops and all that I knew about, you know, metaphysics and blah, 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 just to get them out of the house. And every idea I came up with, no, 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 and my ideas kept getting further and further out and more convoluted, no, no, no. And I finally got really angry with Michael. And I said, Michael, what do you want them to do? Draw an effing door? And I just said it because I thought it was the stupidest idea imaginable. And I was so mad. I said, is that what you want? You want them to draw a door? And he just started laughing and I started laughing and we said, yes. That's exactly what they should do is draw a door. So rather than these incredibly like this convoluted supernatural nonsense, Adam found a piece of chalk, drew a door, drew a doorknob, opened it and went into the afterlife. Simple. But it took all of that convoluted stuff to get there. And that's what will happen when you sit down and you're stuck. You will write and write and write and you won't think you found it, and, and you'll know you haven't found it. But if you keep at it and you'll keep writing, there'll finally be that epiphanal moment where you'll go, oh, that's what happens next. And then you will write that and you will have moved your characters forward one more step in your story. And then the next what happens next is in front of your eyes and you move forward like that. And it's sometimes it's literally moving an inch or less than an inch at a time. And sometimes it's running, sometimes it's crawling, sometimes the what happens next happen really quickly and, and, and you have a day where you just go, oh my God, you know, I just, I just, you know, I just wrote 10 great pages and all they need is just a little, a little sprucing up and they're there and some days you will write 10 pages and you will have maybe a quarter of a page that's usable but you will have moved the story forward that much. And it's, it, it, it's a kind of alchemy, a kind of a, a, a magic of creation, but it's such a beautiful feeling. It's the best job in the world. Do you ever fear writing a boring story? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, um, I, oh, no. I, I, uh, it, it, do you mean fear? Define fear. Define fear right. for me. Well, I, th I think I think for some people, you know, it sounds like you're okay with not being perfect. But I think for some people, that's their whole sort of persona. Maybe they've been told it all their life. Maybe that it's a class thing, or I, I mean, yeah. But that's their element. That's who they are. They they live in that world that I do everything right. So then they don't want to do stuff that's wrong. But it sounds like if you're willing to be free and make mistakes then boring doesn't really enter the picture. I, n yes, and, 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 and that's it. I'm not afraid of being boring because I, I just, the, the, I, I'm, I will jump off creative cliffs and, I, and, and sometimes I'll land really hard and break my neck uh, and sometimes I'll, 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 I'll land exactly where I need to land. But boring isn't an issue for me and it's, and it's interesting because I've been at this a long time time now and I feel more unboring than ever. I feel, I, I feel creatively unleashed. Some of it is I have nothing to prove. I've got some cool posters and a couple of classics and all of that. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, 
I'm not ever worried about boring. I am worried about good. And that's a different thing. And good that it's going to resonate and, uh, and, and, and that people are going to feel it. And that's a different thing. Not, but not boring, but being good, I worry about every day when I write. And I, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm my hardest, uh, harshest critic. And sometimes that gets in the way a, a little bit. I, I, I wish I could go to bed not analyzing and reanalyzing what I wrote th that day, but maybe that goes with the territory. But yeah, I always want to, I, I want to be better than good. And, and I wasn't, you know, and, and again, it's so, sort of silly and, and maybe arrogant as it sounds. And like when I was starting Beetlejuice with Michael, we're going to write a classic. I want everything I do to be great. And you don't always do that. I'm not even pretending that you always do that. But good isn't good enough ever for me. And boring doesn't enter into it. So when you see a student, let's say, that you can tell that's maybe something they need to get out of that rigidity, um, what tips do you have for a writer that, or to help them avoid writing a boring story? Because maybe they're too, too perfect, you know? Yeah, and, and, and it's, and, and it's your, um, yeah, what, it, that's so, that's so true. Um, that uh, students, uh, writers, uh, new, I'm going to say new writers, uh, that sense of perfectionism and that sense that they have to get it right the first time. And uh, when, 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 I, when, when I teach, uh, there, there are people within this room who can attest to this fact. <laughs> when I teach, I am the home of TMI. I come in and vomit everything <laughs> going on in my life, uh, be it good, bad, tragic, uh, happy. Uh, I, I, uh, I, am, I am an open book. If I'm being completely honest, A, because it's free therapy and I have a captive <laughs> audience of 20 people. <laughs> but it's also because I, I, I here, here one, one, of, one of the great sages uh, and uh, of all time and, and uh, with a view of the human condition, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin oh, great reference. said, yeah. uh -huh. said, I never want to be respectable. I always want to be responsible. Oh. And I love that quote. And I hope after the first class that people take with me, they know they're not going to get respectable at all. Uh, I can, I, 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 I will, I will, again, I will tell too much. And there is a little bit of method to my madness, though, because, because I don't want, because I know writers, directors who put themselves on that pedestal because they've had this degree of success and they feel that they have to come in and be very buttoned down and very above uh, uh, the, the people that they're talking to or talking down to. I don't look at it like that at all. I, I will tell you about my bad night, my hangover, my whatever. But, but, and, and part of it, again, it's like free therapy, but part of it is also, this is, this is my life and, and, and where, and it's, sometimes it's not terribly respectable, but I'm responsible because I'm responsible because I will get my ass to my computer and write. And don't worry about being perfect. But that is a that, that that I wish I could say that that my success rate was a hundred percent with that, but again, um, most people will never finish their scripts because that sense of needing to be perfect. Oh, I'm being boring. Oh, this isn't gonna. This isn't working. It will take over and it will crush their creativity. And it's a very sad thing to witness. I try to get people over it. I, I, I try to say, look, it's a first draft. I try, you know, uh, 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 don't worry so much. 
But, but that is the toughest job any person who's teaching any kind of creativity uh, has, is to convince people to get out of their own way. And my way of doing it, again, is to say, today, students, I am a hot mess. But, <laughs> but, those but, are the best but I wrote, but I wrote, but I wrote for four hours. And then they feel okay that they're also imperfect, but whatever sort of front we're all, you know, we all yeah. have our public image that we put out there. I think that's great because or if it's really safe. good, well, they feel superior to me. <laughs> well, whatever works, yeah. Let them, yeah. Let them be yeah. on that, that. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, yeah, but I mean, but, but again, it's it, it's some of it's it's just the nature of my personality, but but some of it's very deliberate. I just don't, you know, I, I, I I've you know I I've knock wicker. Uh, I I've I've made a living at this for thirty years. I mean, it's insane. Sometimes great, sometimes eh, just skating by, sometimes whatever. But it hasn't come out of being perfect, believe me. But it's coming out of, 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 of having a, a, a enough discipline to write. Always don't need to be respectable, always be yeah, responsible. Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page, wow. thank you. Yeah. What are a few of the things you do to try to get people out of their own way? In terms of of of, of, of teaching and and and, and, writing, and, and, yeah. and writing in that regard, one one thing that I that I, I love doing uh, when I'm doing workshops uh, is having like a free write, and I will pick something a, a topic, something that's happened to me that week, or or or, or something that's that's either like making me really happy or really bothering me. It can be in the world, it can be personal and all of that. And I will ask people to write. Just like, let's spend the first half hour of the class just writing about that. And, th and that could be, I was on the phone yesterday and before I knew it, I was saying things that I really regret and I couldn't take back. Have you, have you been on the phone and said things to someone who you really care about that you really regret and, uh, and, and you can't take back? And of course, everyone has. Uh, and people will write. And because, again, I, I, I will be sort of ruthlessly honest with myself, it'll give p people permission to be honest with themselves. And, um, and, and some of the most amazing writing I've had come out of my workshops are those free writes, uh, and 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 it's and it's writing. Th there's going to be so much rejection. There's going to be so much uh, um, uh, indifference. There's going to be there, there there's going to be so uh, so many people saying. No, other people do that. You don't do that. You, that no, other people make movies. You don't make movies. Uh, uh, I, 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 was, I was with a very talented writer, director on, on Sunday night, who was from Georgia, and was talking about when he said to his family he was moving to New York to make movies, he said, I, I might as well have been saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Mars to colonize the red planet. You know, I mean, no, that's, other people do that. A kid from Georgia doesn't do that. And, and I just try to convince people that, the, that, that to just relax. Oh my God, relax, just write it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, some people will hate it. Some people will love it. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice got a lot of terrible reviews. Uh, 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 they were wrong. Uh, I, I, I was told by one of the most prominent executives in Hollywood, I was ruining my career. He was wrong. Uh, uh, people, uh, but what, what, so what if they're right? You'll write another one. And, 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 I, and I love doing free writes. I love saying, reveal a little something about yourself. This is a safe place. And it's amazing what comes out. Uh, if, if people give themselves permission to do that, but it's hardly a perfect process. And, and so many people will be so afraid of how they're going to be judged 
by the words on a, on, on a computer screen, for God's sakes. It's a screenplay, okay? It's a effing screenplay. Get over it, you know? I mean, but they will be so afraid of how they're going to be judged and how they're going to be judged a failure that they'll just quit and they'll figure out something else to do. So I try, I try, and I try to just loosen people up and say, feel, feel free to fail. I started surfing again uh, a couple of years ago after, after uh, 40 years of not doing it. And I was a really good surfer 40 years ago. And I started again, and I was terrible. I mean, I just, everything I thought I knew, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, I knew it in principle, but I had to learn again uh, and then all of a sudden I started getting good again, but it was after a lot of falling off a surfboard and embarrassing myself. Uh, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's that, it's that same thing. You fall off, you fall off, you fall off, and then you don't. And that's, and, and writing is you're going to write badly, you're going to write badly, and then you're going to write good. Larry, do you remember the first time that you pitched one of your screenplay ideas to a producer and it worked? Yes. Uh, I do. Um, and it was to a producer named Barry Cross, and it was an original idea of mine. Uh, and um, it was, uh, and I, I found, I. I I, I, I've gotten to the point where pitching comes pretty easily to me because I've been on both sides of the desk and I know the drill and I know how to do it, but at first it was incredibly difficult. And it was always like the sweaty armpit that, that you know, I mean like, you know, and, and, and as you may, uh, I always worry about with these interviews that, that, that what everyone hears is me stammering, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but I, I remember, I remember telling this story, uh, and um, and he was engaged and he was listening. And you can just I, I I I've had pitches that I've known. Oh, everyone has had these. Two minutes in, it's just a slow death march, basically, and 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 you just want to get it over with and say goodbye and get out of the room. But he was actually engaged and listening, and I knew it was working because then he started asking me questions, and they and and they weren't they they weren't they weren't pol you know the polite. Here's a couple of questions now go away. He he actually was curious, and it was and it was a great feeling, and it allowed me to overcome a, a kind of a, 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 a I, I I used to say that that. Uh, um, I, I, I started teaching, so I learned to talk in front of people, and now you can't shut me up because uh, I was I, I, there was a lot of shyness I had to overcome, and so 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 sitting in front of someone and talking at that point in my life wasn't easy, but I could feel the eye contact and I could feel him engaged in the story. And again, when he started asking me questions that told me he had really been listening, that was a great feeling. And that made and that made pitching easier until the next time I went to pitch and it all went horribly, uh, uh, and I uh, and I've had I've had them go both ways, but I've developed a very thick skin about it now. Uh, and I you know I a, a couple of years ago pitched an idea uh, to uh, Russell Brand's development company when he I think he's. I don't know if he has that company still, but I was told by his executive it's too far out for Russell Brand, and I thought it's too far out for Russell Brand. Oh God, I'm run, I'm ruined. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> and so that that one, I went away going, wow, <laughs> acid flashback, I guess, or something. But yeah, I would have got yeah, but. But so they, they, they can go, they can go both ways. But I, I just, I, I, you know, I, I, what I, what I've developed over the years is a real sense of humor about this stuff. And I, 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 I there, there, there's a, there's a great philosopher who's been a touchstone for me uh, forever named Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. uh, and he once said, um, 
I don't take, it's, a, it's almost like a, a riff on Jimmy Page's, be, don't be respectable, <laughs> be responsible. But he said, don't be serious, be sincere. Hmm. And I think that's so true. And I go into the, and I, I never go into these meetings trying to con someone or not, not or tell them something I don't believe in. And, 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 but, and I treat them very sincerely, but I've learned not to take them seriously. Because if you, because I've seen people, and and I, I could actually tell some very dark stories about people who take have taken this stuff way too seriously, and it's literally destroyed them. And uh, I, you know, and uh, I, I refuse to have a body count like that anymore in my life. And so you go in and you do your best, and you tell them a story, and you think you believe in it. And if it's too far out for Russell Brand, what can I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, we had talked about earlier, and I hope you're okay yeah. talking about this, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. about, you know, maybe not going to college or not, you know, or even yeah. someone just going to junior college and not finishing and, and still having confidence and being an, able to believe in yourself, even yeah. if somebody in the sort of, you know, executive suit sitting on the other side of this really nice mahogany desk with their arms folded tells you, no, you're, you're not okay. Yeah. But, but also knowing that you are, how, how, where does that come from? Because I don't think that that's something that's innate. I think you, you probably develop it over time, wouldn't you say? Yeah, um, and, and, and it was an issue for me. There's no doubt about it. When I, when I became a, a studio executive at Paramount, um, working most closely with Jeff Katzenberg, um, it was all of a sudden there was this, uh, th this a as these bizarre trends happen and you don't quite understand uh, where they come from and then why they go away. But all of a sudden it became very important to hire uh, people in development positions who had a Harvard education. And, um, I was working with a couple of them, and uh, and and they also went to the school of Machiavelli, I guess, and, and uh, <laughs> had it's read and reread the Art of War, <laughs> and 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 on on strategically on that level, they could kill me dead, okay. But I thought about it, and I thought I've loved movies since I I can remember. And while I was terrible in school, I was a terrible student. My mom loved reading and she taught me a love of reading. So I had that on my side. But what I really had on my side was if I loved a movie, I loved a movie. I loved it. And, and if I, and, and I realized pretty quickly that the movies, the movie business, it was not a, 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 a business meant for Harvard grads. And I could read a script and say, this is a movie and say it with as much confidence as possible and, 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 and mean it and believe it. And uh, I, and, but I was up against this, I, this, this and, and my own inferiority complex sometimes about not having been a good student and not having, you know, barely gotten out of high school. It would work on me sometimes. But one day after I'd been co completely creamed in, 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 a, in a development war with, with one of these Harvard grads, uh, Jeff Katzenberg took me aside and he said, Larry, you need to learn to be a straight player in a crooked game. Mm -hmm. I'm not here for you to out manipulate anyone. You're sitting with me and you have, and, and you're sitting beside me here because when you love something, you love it. And when you read a script and you love it, you're going to make sure that you, that, that, that everyone else loves it too. And, 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 and that's what I like in you. And that's why you're valuable to me. Stop trying to be a studio executive. Be a guy who can read a script or watch a movie and, and get excited the way you get excited. Mm. And that, that was uh, uh, a, a huge shot in the arm of confidence that I, that I took away. And uh, I, I, I owe Jeff Katzenberg 
gratitude for a lot of things that he wouldn't even be aware of. But that was a big one because he told me, just be yourself and use this passion for movies and this love for movies and make that your calling card. Don't try to be uh, a, a player. You're not good at it. You're horrible at it, <laughs> which I am because I wear everything on my sleeve. Ask my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the good, bad, and the ugly of writing meetings. So yeah. how does a writer personally contribute to the success or failure of a pitch meeting? Or maybe it's not really within their control, but they feel they've contributed to it. Um, you, well, you do contribute to it. And, um, and it, 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 it's really grossly unfair to having been on the other side of the desk, having been a studio executive. It's, 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 everyone has pitch nightmare stories and they're, they're true, but it's really unfair to uh, development people and studio executives to assume that everyone in those meetings is there to make, basically make your life miserable and say no to you. It's not true. Uh, and, and, what, and how you contribute to it as a writer, you come in with an idea that you've actually thought through and that you have some passion for and that, and that, and, and that also you need to be willing to listen. It's a conversation and, and uh, the control you have of the conversation is you're the one coming in with the idea. You're the, you're the one coming in and saying, hey, I think this would be a great movie, this would be a great television show, whatever, and you should have thought it through, and you, sh you should have prepared well enough to, to, when they say, well, why do you think it's such a great idea, to be able to answer the questions, and you should know enough about your story that, 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 that you can do it justice in the room. But then, having sat as an executive, I've also been in those meetings where you say to someone, yeah, I get it, but, and they immediately, what but? There is no but. This is the story. You have nothing to say to me. And, and a defensiveness goes up, and that's a huge mistake. You don't, don't go to the meeting. Just write the stupid script. Uh, it's a conversation, and it's a dialogue, and don't assume that you know more than the person in the room who you're speaking to. Have it as a conversation and be strong and know when you need to dig in your heels and know that, that, there are, there, there, that if people are changing your story in the room so much that you don't even recognize it anymore, which could happen, that you need to say no and, and say thank you for the meeting and leave. But engage in the conversation, have a little bit of Effing humility, for God's sakes! You know, you you you're, you've been invited into the room to tell someone a story. You, you, don't 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 assume that they that they don't have a thought in their head. And there are so many stories, and again, a lot of them are true. And I could tell you nightmare stories about pitches. We could stay here all night, and I could tell you those stories. But it's but I could also tell you great stories with great development people. Uh, who, who have, who have uh, uh, um, given me enough rope to hang myself, then said, but what if this happened or that happened? And then they've given me a better idea and a better take. It's a dialogue, it's a conversation, and it's part, of the, it's part of the business. And I hate to call it a game, but I will for a moment. It's part of the game. But if you just can't stand the idea of going in and telling a story and someone's going to try to change it, uh, or, or have an idea, write the script. Don't be a, a pitch monkey, be a screenwriter. So then how does a screenwriter keep their side of the street clean? So whatever happens on the other side of that desk, whether the person's kind with their suggestions or not, how do they keep their own integrity and, and, and poise and all of that? By having integrity. You, you, and, 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 and knowing that you, you're going in with something uh, uh, that, that you believe in and that you're excited about. And so if they completely don't get it, 
or say stuff that you think has nothing to do with what you've just pitched with them, you know within yourself that the story you went in to tell is the story that you want to tell and you really believe it could be a movie and you can really be excited about it. Integrity, integrity is an inside job. And if, you, if you're looking to, to have your, your integrity brought to you by Hollywood, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> no? No. Okay, no. Right, no. It, it's, 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 it's an inside job. And I, if I go in to pitch a story, I, I, I don't do it unless I believe in it. And, and, and I may be wrong. I may be wildly wrong. Uh, um, but I, I won't leave going, well, you know what, I thought I'd put that one over on them, but they didn't, you know, I, that, 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 you know, they, but they didn't get it, but oh well, I mean, I'll go, I told the best story I could. And then you let it go. You just let it go. It's a good meeting, it's a bad meeting, but you did your best. And that's an inside job. And it's a learned experience too. And you will come out of meetings wondering who you are and, and what you're going to be when you grow up. I still have meetings like that, but, but most of the time I come away feeling good. Yeah, that was my next question. Yeah. How do, how do, because it sounds like you just have to go through it, have a, a feud where you're like basically in the fetal position when you go home, and then it's less so. You're just on the couch, and then yeah. the next yeah. time you yeah. just take a walk around the block. Yeah, and I, I, I don't end up in the fetal position much anymore. Uh, because um, I, I, I believe in what I do. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anyone else has to believe in it, but I believe in it. But it sounds like it was, it's a learned thing and that there's no, there's no magic answer. No. And, and no, there, there's no, there's no magic answer. And again, it's one of those things that I've seen people get crushed yeah. in these meetings, crushed where they can't come back again. And that's, again, that thing about having an over developed sense of perfection <laughs> or perfectionism to say it more simply that will will be your worst enemy you had a bad meeting i i i i was in a th th there was there was this this time uh where everything was supposed to be based on joseph campbell remember those days when everything you had Thursday, to go in yeah. you know and 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 that was what you were supposed to that was what you were <laughs> you were always if you were going to pitch you were you were gonna you you were, you were gonna you were gonna pitch something that, and Joseph Campbell was gonna end up in the sentence, <laughs> and I was going in with a producer who said, "Now remember to get the Joseph Campbell moments in there," and I was pitching. I was about three minutes into it, and the guy across the desk said, "Oh Jesus Christ, can we get over the Joseph Campbell stuff? Can you just <laughs> tell me the story?" And the meeting died a horrible death, and I should never have done it. I should have just said, here's the story. And if you see Joseph Campbell in it, good for you. But, but uh, th those are those things. Don't, don't trick yourself. Just go in and tell the best story that you can. A Twitter question. Yeah, so we had a question come in on Twitter two days ago. And we'll, we'll leave the person's name off just in case they don't want it there. But I'm, I'm sure they're OK with it. Yeah. But uh, they just asked, I'd like to know how one secures a pitch meeting with executives or production companies as a first-time screenwriter. And then they followed it up with, I mean, does one just make a call and set a date and time? Do you go in with a treatment or dot, dot, dot? And then there's more of it. But so. OK. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm thinking yeah, because sure, that, sure. That's, that, that's, that's, a, that's quite a question. Uh, how do you secure a meeting? Um, you write a screenplay and you write a really, really good screenplay and the metaphysics of getting a meeting after that are so elusive. Sorry, uh, I, I, I'm not, I, and, and it's a very sincere question, and, I, and I, 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 it gets asked to me uh, all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going, so I'm going to dance around it a little bit, but I'm going to, but again, uh, not seriously, but sincerely. Um, there was a time when I was teaching. 
And uh, the, here's something about me, uh, me as a teacher. I am a, I, I, I am a screenwriting teacher who's not a failed screenwriter. I'm actually a successful screenwriter who teaches at the same time. Uh, oh God, that was cheap. Uh, I apologize. Uh, uh, but um, I, 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 stopped, I stopped teaching at one point because I really had an ethical dilemma. Because I thought the real reason people were taking my classes is to say to me, how do you get a movie made? You've gotten movies made. You've gotten through the door. How do I get through the door? And I could have been teaching anything. I could be teaching story analysis, screenplay structure, dialogue, anything. And I thought the real reason that people were there was to ask me, Larry Wilson, how do I get a pitch meeting? How do I get a movie made? How do I get through the door? And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. And I felt like I was like part of this false hope machine. And I didn't like it, and I didn't like the way it made me feel. And I stopped teaching. And the thing that brought me back to teaching, and where I could do it again, were a question like that, which I wish I had a great answer. I, 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 look, I've, I, I've been blessed uh, by the fact that doors open, unexpected doors open for me my entire life after I moved to Hollywood. I was working in a department store stocking makeup uh, because, I'd because I'd cleaned my mother's beauty shop for years and I knew how to stock makeup. And the woman who loved the way I stocked her makeup said, oh, so you want to be in like the, the entertainment business? Well, you should do cue cards. And she introduced me to a man named Barney McNulty. And the next thing I knew was I was doing cue cards on all the biggest television shows of the time. A door opened. I can't explain why that happened, why I went in stocking makeup and that door opened. Luck and all of that, it's too complex of a question. But, and, but I knew it was what people were asking. I hope this is making sense. I, I knew it was what people were asking me, really. How do I get through the door? How do, how do I get my script read by someone that matters? Well, there's some easy pat answers to that. They're not pat, but you know. There's, there's, there's contests, there's pit orgies, there's all the, you know, these millions of things out there that you need to be careful about what you submit to. But there's all those ways, but there is no answer to the question. But the, and, and I got very, I, I, I really started, I had an ethical dilemma about it. I did not want to be trafficking in false hope and that I had some magical answer. So the first part of the answer is write a really great script. But the reason I was able to come back to teaching was the digital revolution. And the fact that you can make a movie, holding up my cell phone, ladies and gentlemen, you can make a movie on your cell phone now. You can make a movie for a thousand bucks. There is no excuse for you not to make a movie anymore. And knowing that, and knowing that I could go in and help people write a great screenplay, and that they, and if no one would give them the time of day, they could figure out how to write a great screenplay that they could shoot for $500 on their iPhone inspired me to come back to teaching? And the answer is, there is no answer. The, the answer is you, you put yourself in every possible place, conceivable place you can think of without getting ripped off uh, by sham screenplay contests and all that. You put yourself in every conceivable place you can think of. You submit your script anywhere you possibly can. You talk to anyone who you think might be able to help you and maybe that door will open for you. But if none of that works, make your own movie. Sorry, you know, I, I, and, 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 I, and, and it's, 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 it's a great place to be, but it's a scary place for people to be. When I started in, in the business a, a, a billion years ago, making a movie was expensive. Just a film stock could stop you from making a movie. The cost of printing and developing and dailies and all of that could stop you from making a movie. It wasn't that people didn't do it, but it was incredibly difficult. But the digital revolution, if you can't get your stuff seen, if you can't get a pitch meeting, shoot a film. Shoot, shoot, shoot a 10-minute shoot a short and post it on YouTube. 
Take your career and your life into your own hands and stop waiting for these gatekeepers to give you permission to be a filmmaker. And you can, at the same time, you're trying to get through that door and you're trying to get that pitch meeting and you're trying to get that huge movie off the ground. Do all of that, but be making your, your iPhone movie. Be, and, 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 and it's an answer that people don't want to hear. Why? Why do you think they don't want to hear it? Because, because it puts all the responsibility on them. It, 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 makes them, it makes them have to make a movie. It makes them have to do something in public and perhaps fail. Mm. It makes them have to go to their mother and say, can I have a thousand bucks, mom? Why? Well, I want to make a movie. If you think I'm going to spend a thousand dollars, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it just puts all the responsibility back on you as, as, as a screenwriter and a filmmaker. And people hate that. They want that ticket that that is going to open that door and i wish i had an answer i have struggled with that question for decades of teaching mm. and i don't know why these doors open for me i don't know i know i was persistent i was idiotically persistent i literally was that that doofus who went around to to to, to the guard gates at, at, at studios and said I want to make a movie. How do I make a movie, sir? You know, to a, to a gate guard. I mean, I literally did that because I was so dumb. I didn't know any better. But one of them finally said to me, well, son, what do you, what do, you do? Well, I read. Well, then become a script reader. How do I do that? Well, ask someone. And I got a job $75 a week reading scripts. And it was, and then I got it, you know, and, and then I was like working, you know, in a cosmetic counter in a May company. And I, and I, you know, I mean, it's just stupid stuff that, that's the way life works or doesn't work for you. But the whole, the whole landscape has changed where anyone can make a movie now. What that means is there will be millions of bad movies, but make sure yours is a good one. And, you know, and, and oh God, here build it and they will come or whatever that is. <laughs> so that's the best answer I can give. And it's not, I wish, uh, question, ans ask her, I could give you a better answer, but it's the only answer I can honestly give you because I don't know. Let's talk about some faulty rules of writing, okay. some old adages on writing that really don't apply today. Yay. And okay, let's. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we can... You start. Uh, okay, I'll... well, well, you know, you talked about, you know, Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, and, yeah. and it's still, I mean, to, to hear him speak in these YouTube videos is, is a magical experience. Yes, it's not absolutely. to knock him at all. But I'm just wondering if, as a teacher, there are, there's classes that your students have taken previously that drum into you certain adages that really don't apply. I mean, we know, what what is it... Uh, Writing is rewriting. That, that seems pretty Fair. legit. Yeah, 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 that sounds like yeah. it's true. Yeah. So something similar to that, and I'm not sure what it would be. But. Uh, okay. Um, there is a huge business, maybe an overly huge business, in teaching screenplay structure a three-act structure, a five-act structure, you know, and, and, and there are, there are I, I, know, I know a fair share of screenwriting gurus who are at each other's throats all the time about which structure is the structure. And I'm not saying there's not a structure. I would be in big trouble if I said there wasn't a structure and that a story didn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But this reliance, the, 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 this absolute like, like need to follow any structure map that's out there. And if, you're, and if you don't have a turning point on page 30, you haven't done it right. Or if you're on step five of 22 steps, and you're on the wrong step, you haven't done it right, or any of this stuff, it's not true. This structure business, it's a business. And I can't, I, and, and you need a diagram. 
to teach structure and, 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 and you sell a diagram. And it's very, it's, it's, it's very hard to, 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 to say I have the best diagram unless you have a diagram, right? I mean, you need a diagram to sell a diagram. I told you earlier about my diagram that ends on page 60, 60 with yeah. someone hanging themselves. <laughs> it's an emotional diagram. It goes like this. It's like page one. Oh, God, I can do this. This is going to be great. This is the best story ever. Page 10. Oh, my God, I can really do this. Everyone was wrong about me. My parents can go F themselves. I'm a writer. <laughs> on and on, emotional. And then like about page 20, you go, oh, God, this is really getting hard. And it starts, and the graph starts going down and down. And then again, you get to page 60 and like, I'll never finish this. You hang yourself. It's my structure, okay? It's an emotional structure. Uh, it's an emotional diagram. But... Well, wait, sorry to interrupt, but what happens after the, the hanging man diagram? Oh, well, you, you, you go into despair okay. for a while. You put yourself to bed. Then you wake up and you start again. And it has a happy ending. Oh, good. And at the ending, there's big bags of money, all the sex you ever wanted, power, the, you know, <laughs> you win, right? Uh, uh, but it's, it, it, it's, it's obviously tongue-in-cheek and, and to make a point. But, but, the, but the real point of it is, is that have characters who you believe in and you believe that you can write them and that they are in some sense writing you, that they're coming out of a place of truth for you, put them in the tightest, most impossible situation you can imagine and get them out of it. And know that you have probably need to do it if you're writing a screenplay in 100 to 120 minutes and let the story flow. And there will be natural points uh, within you doing that where you will feel that the story needs to go faster, needs to go slower, uh, that, that, that there needs to be more drama, there needs to be a moment of rest. All of these things that structure teaches you, and again, I'm not saying there isn't a structure, but those structure diagrams, they can be an, an, an uh, assist you or they can be a cage. Hmm. They can be an absolute cage and they can trap you and uh, there is, if you believe that, you, that you're a writer, you have a natural storytelling gift that you need to honor, that you need to respect, or don't be a writer. I mean, don't, don't, don't think that you can tell a story if you don't feel that you have a natural storytelling gift and you can't tell when things are going too slowly or things are going too fast and just let it flow and then go back and see if it's structured right. But this is another thing that will stop people dead in their tracks over and over again is your first act is too long. Who cares? Who cares? You'll figure that out if writing is rewriting in the rewrite. And, and, and watch a lot of movies, read a lot of books. I, I'm now, because of, 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 of uh, constraints of time sometime, I'm a podcast junkie. I hear the most brilliant stories in podcasts and stories that have a natural beginning, a middle, and an end because they're true. Just embrace all of that. Embrace the movies that you love. Take them to your heart. And if you're a storyteller, the story will emerge and it will emerge with a structure. Let's talk about... I um, hope of, that answered. It, it does, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering, is there anything about the business that's sort of a fallacy? These... these you know, this in the same vein. So you talk about, um, I, I'm struggling for what one would be, but where you have this saying that's not really true. Uh, okay, so again, I want to say that there are a lot of really terrific development executives out there. There are a lot of great producers. I've worked with some truly great producers. Uh, I, I, I worked with Scott Rudin on, uh, on The Addams Family uh, for, for a couple of years. There's never been a, a, a producer who I've worked with who understands story more deeply than Scott Rudin. 
and Scott Rudin, and when I wrote and, and uh, when I wrote Adam Sandler with my, Car with my partner Caroline Thompson, one of his greatest gifts was he let us fail over and over again, even finding the idea for what the movie was going to be. So there are great there are great development executives. There are people who understand story who will help you with your story, uh, but but there are also people out there who 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 are development executives who who've never written a script, never made a movie, what are they going to use to come in and, and talk to you about? They're going to use a structure. They're going to use a structure diagram. They're going to read the same book you read and they need to have, say, have something to say to you to, to justify their jobs. They need to have something to say to you to bring you in and say, you know what? As, as, your, as, as your development executive, I'm telling you that your first act is too long. Well, where are they getting this information from? They're, they're, they're not getting it from movie God. They're, they're, they're getting it from the same book that you read. And so, and so like all self-reinforcing systems, uh, structure, structure guides and structure diagrams become their own truths that everyone buys into and pays homage to until someone doesn't and someone breaks it all apart and does something that's innovative and doesn't follow any of the rules and then those become the rules. Can I recommend a, 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 a podcast since we're talking about podcasts? Sure. There's a podcast, it's six parts, you can binge listen to it called Inside Psycho and it's about the making of Psycho. Hmm. Go to your, wherever you get your podcast and listen to the development of that movie, that classic movie that is now considered one of the great movies of all time and where it started and what the powers that be thought of it. And you will see how wrong people can be. Hmm. And Anyone who is, who is holding up your story that you're telling to a graph and saying it doesn't fit the graph, therefore it's a bad story, watch out. They may have a point. You're, you may need to get cut to the chase and, get, and maybe the first act is too long. But if they're holding it up to a graph and that's all they know how to do, uh, you need to look within yourself and say, am I telling the story right? Not as a structure guide telling me if I'm telling the story right. I hope that sort of answers the it question. It does. It almost reminds me of Jimmy Page smashing a guitar, Yeah. basically. Sort of like, you know, yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. he wasn't the first one to do that. And, 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 yeah, but it is. I mean, and, and again, it's that, that allow yourself to fail the first time, but allow yourself to tell the story the way the story emerges from you. And if you're a storyteller, the story will emerge, and you have to believe you're a storyteller. How about the old put it in a drawer for a month and then come back to it once you're finished with the screenplay? Uh, very true for me. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I always bow to the wisdom of Stephen King and it's something he does. And if you get his book on writing, maybe the only writing book you'll ever need until I publish mine, um, he talks about that process and how he puts it away. And there's, there's a brilliant uh, final chapter of that book where he actually shows you after the, the story had gone away for a while, the edits that he did. Uh, great, but, uh, but I put it away because what I find is that just getting from beginning to end, you're so immersed in it, you're so, you're so deep inside of it. In some, in, in some funny way, you don't know what you have. And what's an amazing experience is you go back and reread it and you go, did I write that? You didn't even remember writing it, which is like really, uh, and it has nothing to do with the, whatever chemicals you're ingesting when you're writing. It just has to do with the, the process of it. It's, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, but um, um, then what, what I will do is I will take it out of the drawer and my drafts tend to be really too long because I'm explaining so much of the story to myself in the draft in the first draft, I will, go, that I will do a radical edit on it. I will take as much out as I possibly can and see, and, 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 and just like by feel, and try to tell the story 
if it's 140 pages, I may cut it down to 110 pages less. That's a lot. But then I may go back and then I'll put it away again, but it won't be for as long. It'll be for like a couple of weeks or something. Then I'll go back and reread it and see, oh, maybe, maybe I've taken too much out. Maybe this does need to be explained. But you do, but, but, but the point is, however this process works for you, you do need to step away from it when you can. Now, I've been in a work situation. I, I have an animated uh, a, a new film coming out, Halloween 2017, to a theater or a digital platform near you, The Little Vampire, an animated movie that I actually think is good, good, I'm happy to say. And, and maybe we can post a, a, a link to a clip some people can judge yeah. for themselves. Uh, is the trailer ready? Uh, the trailer is, is being rendered and almost oh. ready. Uh, I, we've seen a cut of it and it's pretty terrific. Uh, but that was a situation that I was in where there was no time for that. And you will be put it be because the work had to go and get to the animators. There wasn't time for me when there were rewrites going on to say, well, I'll just put it away for a couple of weeks and look at it. It kind of had to come hot off the, the the, the presses, if you will, you know, hot off the, uh, go, go straight from the computer to the animators. And I had a partner, uh, my great partner, Richard Klaus, who we go back and forth, but there wasn't a lot of time. Now that's a different circumstance. And then you kind of got to live with what you wrote and hope that it works. But most of the time, and particularly for new writers, uh, that stepping away for a few weeks and then rereading it and rereading with a fresh eye is crucial. Let's talk about one of the most frustrating experiences as a screenwriter without, you know, naming any names or projects, but what it taught you, whether it was about the process, um, yourself, other people, working in a, a, a group. Um, uh, the, 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 mo the most frustrating Part. Look, look. I, I have a very sort of unique and singular thing that I do, and uh, you know, this dark supernatural comedy, and sort of a surreal uh, uh, take on things, and all of that. And I kind of consider myself like licorice in a way that you either love it and you eat it or you spit it out. Um, uh, but. When I've been frustrated a couple of times without naming names is when people basically ask me in a roundabout way to deliver Beetlejuice to them, deliver something that's quirky and idiosyncratic and, and, and surreal and I've delivered it and I know it's good and they're scared of it and they try to ask me to tone it down and tame it to a point where it loses exactly what they ask me for. It's like you want, there is no next Beetlejuice. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this metaphorically or as an analogy, if you will. But when people say, just be you, just give us straight you, and then they get it and they go, ooh, I don't know. And, and, and you know, and, and it, it, my, my great partner, Caroline Thompson, who I wrote The Addams Family with, and Caroline, you know, wrote Edward Scissorhands, Corpse Bride. I could go on and on with her credits. Uh, we, we've said to each other, ironically sometimes, wouldn't it be nice if we could walk into a room and say, look, here's who we are, here's what we've done, here's what we want to do. Given what we've done, could you just please trust us to do it and, 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 and see what happens? But that's not the nature of it. And, and so my frustrations have come when I feel like I've really delivered something and, and I, I'm not gonna name names, but there's, a, there's one currently that I could, I, I could go off a bit if I chose to. I, cho I choose not to go off about this stuff and get angry about this stuff much anymore. But where I really broke my creative back giving someone something fresh and new and original and what exactly what they asked me to do and it scared them and they ran away from it and that is frustrating and but there's always the next one but you put you know uh, a year six months whatever it was of your of, of that much uh, uh, 
energy, creative energy and your heart and soul into something and you think you've given someone exactly what they want. And I'm not, I'm not arrogant about my work. I'm not saying it was perfect or anything, but I knew what was there was like really there. It, 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 it would have been good, good. And they just, and they, and they got cold feet. And that's frustrating. But, you know, but then I say, well, DIY, you know, I'll do it myself in, an, in another way. And that's the beauty of what's happened to the business now is I have that safety net of saying, well, if they don't like it, if they don't like me anymore, if everyone wants me to go away, they've had enough of Laurie Wilson, I'll make my iPhone movie. I'll be exactly what I want. I think it's interesting to think about, you know, and I'm sure musicians have gone through the exact same thing, when you have these hits and then people always want you to go back to them and make a newer version. And can you talk about the pressure and at what point did you feel that pressure? Oh, wow. Um, th th very, very distinctly. Um, I, I got into a, it, it was not, you know, these problems of the well-to-do, as my grandma used to say. Um, uh, I, I got into a position after, after uh, Beetlejuice and the Addams Family, they were just breakout huge hits that people didn't see coming where uh, I, I kind of got in that, that, that golden uh, trap of where I would be hired under the, uh, un, without credit usually, not under the table, but without credit, to come in and write a scene or write a couple scenes for something, most of which never made it to the screen, but I'd get paid a lot of money to do it. I mean, a lot of money. And that's, you know, and, 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 and but, and, and, um, and it was always that, give us the Beetlejuice scene, give us, give us the Deo scene, give us the, you know, uh, the, the, the Adams family, you know, the, uh, wh whatever it was, you know, give us that. And, and I, and, but what I realized I was becoming was I was becoming a hack. And, or I, I was on the verge of becoming a hack, a well-paid hack, but a hack. And I was deliberately repeating myself or thinking I was repeating myself for a paycheck. Well, I've had, you know, I have children and, and, and the, the, my motives are pure, I guess, and, a little, and, a, and some greed too, of course. Uh, but I made a break and uh, I, a producer came to me and said, I want you to do something for me. And uh, my, there's a script of mine called Sleepless Beauty, which sadly has never been made. It's been, it's been to the starting gate so many times, uh, it's unbelievable. But it's one of the best things I ever wrote because the deal I made with the producer was, okay, I will do this, but here's the deal. Just leave me alone for the first draft. Just don't, let's not have a hundred meetings. Let's, let, let's not do it the typical way. Don't ask me to do this, do that. Just let me write it. And it just, after, after feeling like I was really headed into hackdom, I wrote this script so fresh and it's one of the first, the only scripts where we were talking about putting it in a drawer where the first draft is basically the draft. There may have been some sprucing up and some changes, but it just came out of me. It just flowed out of me. And I realized again that I needed to be that writer. And I changed my career too, much to the unhappiness of my agent in some ways and my people. And I started working a lot in Europe. And I found a way to go there and, and, and work because I found a certain amount more respect, I guess, for, for the writing process. And I was thinking to myself, well, I can go work in London or I can go work in Amsterdam or I can go work in Paris or I can go to Burbank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what will I do? And I refound myself as a writer. And um, um, that, and I don't even remember the question at this point, but I, I, I hope the, the the answer is that what I became again was true to myself. Hmm. It sounds like that's really important. 
the, well, just important being, to me. Yeah. I think it's important to every, everyone. I, I do, but I think to, for some people, maybe the, the, the comfort, and I can't knock that, mm -mm. especially if, you know, for me, I came from very modest beginnings, so I could see how people would want oh, that. Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, absolutely, yeah. especially yeah. in this town, yeah. when that's really how your success is measured. Yeah. And so, but it sounds like that's, that's very important, is being able to live with yourself and your work yeah. and not just for the paycheck. And I get it, everybody wants that paycheck. Oh my gosh, yes, yeah. And you, you, have, you have kids and houses and responsibilities and of course you want it. And, and, and uh, I, I, I didn't turn my back and starve my family. I don't wanna put it like that. But, but, but there was a calculation to it also, a career calculation, which was, who's, you know, it's that, it's that, that formula, who's Larry Wilson? Oh, that's Larry Wilson. Get me Larry Wilson. Then get me the next Larry Wilson. That Larry Wilson is over. And I could feel myself getting to get me the next Larry Wilson point. And again, I just, I could feel my, the, the, the quality of my work diminishing. And maybe this is the, 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 the moment to wrap on. You, you'll tell me. But what, what I write has always counted the most to me because it, it, it saved my life. Uh, I would not be the person I am uh, if I didn't have that, that my writing. I, my, my life, I, can't, I can't imagine what my life would have been. Uh, and to, and, and it, it, it's, a, it's a place and a truth I need to go back to to save my soul. I mean, uh, not to be overly dramatic about it, but it's just the fact of it. And so, so when I feel that, going away and I'm just doing it just for the money mm -mm, doesn't work for me and um, I have the bank account to prove it which means send money ladies and gentlemen <laughs> all donations gratefully accepted can you talk us through how you make a beat sheet I don't uh, I, I I, I will, if contractually obliged to doing a beat sheet or an outline, I will do it. And sometimes you are. And what usually happens is you spend all this time on this beat sheet and this outline and it's the most bastardized thing in the world because it's not a script, it's not a story, it's kind of this thing that exists halfway between a script and a story. And I will, but I will do it if contractually obliged to. I'll do an outline and I'll do a very detailed outline and I'll do it always to the best of my abilities. I won't slum, but I'll do it and I'll hand it in. And the producers will go, we love this outline. This is a great outline. Now go write the script. And you'll go write the script and you'll have your outline. And you'll say, okay, here's what the outline is telling me. And you'll start writing and it'll immediately start changing and better ideas will emerge. And the next thing you know, the outline is completely out the window and you've written a script and you'll turn it in and the producers will go, we love this, this is just like the outline and everyone's forgotten the outline. And, 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 and I don't, I know, again, my, my beat sheet is, I, obviously you kind of know the beginning. You know you're putting your characters and you feel these characters and you put them in this situation that they're gonna have to fight for their lives to get out of. Uh, I kind of know what the end is going to be, kind of, sort of, and then it's the great unknown. And to do that in a beat sheet to me is just taking all the fun out of it. So don't, don't, don't listen to me. Listen to all the other people out there who say outline beat sheets. Please, if that's what you need to do, and there's great writers who do that. Of course, they do that. But, and, and sometimes when you're collaborating, it becomes more necessary because you're sending stuff back and forth. But for me, I, I, they don't work for me. And, and anytime I do them, everything starts changing anyway so much that, that, that they quickly become irrelevant. Why don't they work for you? Because, I, because I, I, I'm, I'm a storyteller. And, and the stories emerge from someplace that, that, that is beat sheet proof. That's just me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what, I mean, they, they, just, they just come from somewhere else. And if I tell it all in a, in a, in a quote unquote beat sheet, it's like, it's like why, why would I do that to myself? Why, why, why would I 
why, why would I take all the fun out of discovering it and put it in this thing that's just kind of bullet points? Uh, it just, it, but that's me, it, and, and that's the idi idiosyncratic part of me. But I'm in good company. Stephen King, my favorite writer, uh, ask him about beat sheets. Uh, uh, um, uh, there's, but, but, you know, uh, help me, the writer who wrote Game of Thrones, the books. George R. R. Martin. Thank you. He said it the best of anyone. He said there are, now, now you would think, particularly if you've read the Game of Thrones books, that those things are outlined completely. They're so intricate. They're so full of plot and character and this needs to overlap and this needs to, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're extremely intricate stories. He doesn't outline. And what he says about it is, and I think it's such a great quote, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's the essence of it. There are architects and there are gardeners. An architect will need that blueprint to build what it is they're going to build. He said, I'm a gardener. I plant a seed and I tend it and nurse it and I watch it grow. And there are architects who will do that beat sheet and will do it brilliantly and, and I'm, so I'm not knocking it. And then there are gardeners and I guess I'm a gardener. I just kind of let the idea sit there and I tend it and I, and I take good care of it and make sure it gets all the water and sun and then I watch it grow.